Welcome back to the Stronger by Science podcast. My name is Eric Trexler. I am the special temporary primary host of the show. And today I'm joined by Greg Knuckles. He is currently the permanent guest co-host for the time being. Greg, how are you doing today? I'm doing well. How are you? I am doing great. Uh, Now, I know because this is a multimedia experience, some people are going to say, Eric, Greg, you look exactly the way you looked last week. Same clothes, same demeanor. Uh, The reason is, uh, this is a family values podcast. We've always been very open about that, very proud of that, in fact. And as part of a family values podcast, we have to value our families. So what that means is we want to spend some time for Thanksgiving with our loved ones. And uh, so we recorded both of these episodes on the same day. But if you're listening at home, you're getting this on, if you're listening it right when it comes out, which you should, we, we do recommend if you want the freshest podcast, you should listen the day it comes out. Uh, you're listening on November 28th, and that's an important day because it's the final day of the Mass Research Review Black Friday sale. These are the lowest prices of the year for the Mass Research Review, which comes out the first of the month, every single month, like clockwork. We've been doing it for years, never late, always a really great PDF, usually like 100, 150 pages long, tons of nutrition and exercise research, very practical, always focus on how we can use this information to get bigger, stronger, faster, leaner, etc., Uh, So the Mass Research Review, it's articles, it's really brief, skimmable research briefs that we introduced within the last year or so, it's audio discussions, it's video lectures, everything you could ever want from me and Greg and our good friends, Dr. Mike Zordos and Dr. Eric Helms. Uh, So it's the last day of the sale, like I said, lowest prices of the year, and uh, this this sale benefits charity. So so we are going to be making a donation. Uh, with a portion of the proceeds from this sale that is going to go to a charity that fights hunger. uh, And uh, it's a food bank charity to make sure that people are getting fed over the holiday season. So a really, really good cause. Uh, Now, there are other ways to support the show. Uh, If any listeners feel so inclined, you could like, rate, or subscribe wherever you get the show. You could join our email newsletter, which sends out uh, every Wednesday, we send a, a research update. Uh, with some really helpful information. So you can figure that out or get on that list over at strongerbyscience.com slash newsletter. If you're looking for one-on-one virtual coaching, we do offer that. You can learn more at strongerbyscience.com slash coaching. You want to get a discount on your supplements. You go to bulksupplements.com and you use the checkout code SBSPOD. It gets you a 5% discount on your entire order. Uh, and of course, you could check out the Macro Factor Diet app, which we co-developed with a talented team of developers. Uh, it does offer a free trial, so you can take it for a spin, see if you like it, and we think you're going to love it. And if you do, make sure you stick around and subscribe for Macro Factor. Now, this is going to be another Q&A episode, so we've got some great questions. We get these from the Facebook group. Uh, Stronger by Science Community is the name of that Facebook group. We also get these questions from the Stronger by Science subreddit. So if you want to contribute a question in the future, the best way to do that is to join one or both of those communities and keep an eye out for the Q&A threads that come up periodically. Uh, so Greg, where are we starting here? Yeah, so uh, let's let's uh, start in the subreddit. Uh, there was a question by Oryx Math. Uh, actually, two questions. So uh, the first... Um, essentially asks I was going to say there's no way you're going to read that question verbatim right? no I don't uh, I don't I don't read that well <laughs> yeah. Um, but but yeah so it, it's essentially asking like hey it seems like a lot of training programs out there are very powerlifting influenced powerlifting inspired um, so they do plenty of squat bench deadlift which are great exercises in their own right but if uh, if you and I wanted to design kind of a you know core set of exercises for people who you know are are trying to get bigger and stronger but in more of a recreational way like you you don't really want to compete in bodybuilding don't really want to compete in powerlifting um you know just just generally trying to get bigger stronger but also like healthier be able to move well uh etc um what would those core exercises be and uh uh, he, he, they, they specify, um, 
we, we're not saying that these are the only exercises someone would ever do in a program. And uh, they also encouraged us to not be too vague or general about it. So not say something like some sort of hip hinge movement or some sort of horizontal pulling movement. Uh, like, like be specific. Like if you had to choose a, a group of, of specific exercises that you put out in the world and said, hey, you're trying to get big and strong. These are the ones you should kind of focus on. Uh, what, what would those be? Oh, man. God. That's tough because I didn't read this question beforehand, so I didn't have time to like put together a, a kind of quick thing. I can um, I can take the first swipe. Yeah, you, you go first. Yeah, so I I do think that the um in in broad strokes the general setup of hey we're gonna have a horizontal push we're gonna have a vertical push we're gonna have a horizontal pull we're gonna have a vertical pull. We're going to have some sort of knee dominant lower body exercise and some sort of hip dominant lower body exercise. Um, shout out to Ian King. He was the person who who uh, popularized that general conception of, of grouping things by movement more so than like muscle. Um, I, I'm sure he wasn't the first person with the idea. He's definitely the person who popularized it. And I don't think he gets as much credit in the industry as he deserves anymore. So uh Shout outs to Ian King. But anyways, um, I, I do think that that's a good way to uh, set up most general programs, uh, but to to not be too vague, to give some some specific exercises that I would slot in there for people who are just generally trying to get stronger, build some muscle, but with more of like a a hobbyist kind of like general health perspective for the horizontal push, I would probably go with. Uh, weighted push-ups potentially with an extended range of motion so like feet on the ground hands elevated so your chest can get a little bit lower um gives you a slightly longer range of motion than you have with bench press also lets your scapulae move uh move freely so you can you know uh ha have some good uh uh scapulohumeral rhythm uh as it were get some serratus work in so I i'd probably go with uh with push-ups which then as you get strong you can add some band resistance or or some other form of resistance uh for the uh vertical press i would probably go with either push press or uh single arm uh dumbbell press i think both are excellent um for push press i like that more than just a barbell overhead press because it doesn't have as funky of a strength curve like a, a barbell overhead press basically if you can get it past your forehead it's easy um, with a, with a push press, once you get pretty coordinated at it, you can kind of tune your leg drive such that you have a pretty smooth, uh, strength curve throughout the entire, uh, movement. So I, I, I just prefer push press. And then with, uh, with the single arm dumbbell overhead press, especially if you have kind of cranky shoulders that don't like you a ton, you, you have just way more degrees of freedom where you can find, a hand position, a shoulder position, an elbow position that just helps everything line up right for that press to feel good. Um, so yeah, of, of the two, I think I'd probably go with the single arm dumbbell overhead press, but with, with push press as also a strong contender. For the horizontal pull, I would probably go with a single arm dumbbell row, just so you have a, a bit of... of like rotational work uh as well but i don't know i don't have that strong of opinions about rows in general so if, if i had to choose one it would it would probably be a uh, single arm dumbbell row but th there there are plenty of good options i think i will just default to the general yeah some sort of row um for the vertical pull i would probably just go with like neutral grip pull-ups for people who can do pull-ups for people who can't do pull-ups probably neutral grip pull downs um for the hip dominant lower body exercise probably going to go with trap bar deadlifts uh, i think they're easier to learn than a barbell deadlift um they also are, are just like more accommodating of more degrees of freedom like I, I think a lot of people uh struggle with a barbell deadlift because you want to keep the bar really close to your body, um, but that's generally going to involve scraping the shit out of your shins, which if you're a power lifter, that's cool. Like you get, uh, 
You get scars on your shins and wear them as a badge of pride. A lot of people don't want big, big scars all the way up and down their shins. Um, and so, you know, you get the bar further in front of you, then you kind of get, get further over it, get out of position. Like, eh, I don't know. I, I, I think the barbell deadlift is a great movement, but I think that for most people, the, the trap bar is just easier to learn. Also has a neutral handle, so it's, it's easier to hold on to without a mix grip or straps. Um, and yeah, like it, uh, people, people can have more general degrees of freedom to find kind of the ratio of knee extension to hip extension, uh, uh, force strength that, that makes the most sense for them. Um, but yeah, I, I, I just really like trap bar deadlift. Uh, and then for the quad dominant one, since, um, you know, since the trap bar deadlift is a little bit more knee dominant than a lot of hip dominant lower body exercises, I'm going to go with a slightly more hip dominant, knee dominant lower body exercise for the knee dominant one. Uh, and, and I would probably go with like a rear leg elevated split squat. Um, particularly if, if your lead foot is, is out in front a, a pretty decent way. Um, still going to blow up your quads, but you'll, you'll also, uh, get a lot of, get a lot of glute work from it as well. Um, so yeah, those, those are, those are the six I would probably go for. So j just to reiterate, that's, uh, pushups, particularly hand elevated pushups. Think they're great. Uh, single arm dumbbell overhead press, neutral grip, pull up or pull down, uh, single arm dumbbell row, um, trap bar deadlift and uh rear leg elevated split squats yeah I, there's a lot of agreement uh i would agree with quite a few of those but what i want to do to make this useful is recommend some alternatives that are high on my list uh i think with uh flat press uh, uh some kind of push-up variation was my first choice um but if i wasn't going to do that maybe i would do a low incline dumbbell press um, that would be kind of my second choice. Um, I, I agree fully actually about, uh, for a vertical pull, uh, doing a neutral grip pull up, I think would be my number one. My number two might be a, maybe a chin up just to get more biceps in the mix. Um, when it comes to rows, uh, what I've been doing lately is kind of an interesting setup that I've just kind of found my way toward, uh, just cause I've been babying my hip and lower back. But I, I do it like an inverted row, um, like a rack chin almost, mm -hmm. where I get into the squat rack, I lay the bar across uh, the safety pins, elevate my feet, and I'm basically doing like a horizontal type of pull up. But I've I've been putting the little uh, handles for like the cable machines, mm -hmm. uh, such that they are perpendicular to the bar. I've been kind of sliding them over the bar. So what it what it allows me to oh, do so is can, like, it's a neutral a little bit. Yeah. So it's nice. a neutral grip with a really nice range of motion. Um, I think a lot of people would really like that variation. I've surely didn't come up with the idea. I don't think you could possibly create something that hasn't been created before in the gym. Um, but but I've never seen anyone do it. And I think it's really nice. Mm -hmm. uh, so that'd be my row. With overhead press, we've talked about this before. I'm a big fan of the single arm dumbbell overhead press, but I also like, I would make the controversial argument that I'm not sure that you necessarily need an overhead press in all programs. Yeah, I, I don't, I don't disagree with that. So like, if I was going to drop one category, like the, if I was going to choose an overhead press, that's the one I'd go with. But I'd, I'd also encourage people to say like, or to at least consider is there a reason why I need to be do, doing overhead pressing? Because I would actually say I'd rather do a low incline press and a high incline press rather than like a flat and a completely overhead. Or or just sub out the overhead pressing for something like leg raises. Yeah. Just just so you're not completely neglecting your abs and hip flexors. Or, or, or um, you know, the, the hypothetical was that you're in a really well-equipped gym. Maybe even doing like... Uh, uh, a Husafel stone carry or Atlas stone pickups, uh, or, or doing, uh, like a, a yoke carry, like something that's just going to be massive bang for your buck, get a lot of different muscle groups involved. I, I would, uh, I would probably go with one of those over an overhead press. 
I, I but but you know Fair it kind of just depends what you're looking for and what you feel really confident about doing in the gym um an alternative to the the trap bar deadlift i really like um single leg rdls which i typically do with either a dumbbell or a kettlebell that that was that was my number two yeah, yeah. I, I really like that variation uh for a quad dominant exercise i've always been really partial to walking lunges uh, i think for a lot of people it's a very intuitive quad focused exercise that they can pick up but you still get plenty of really good glute act uh glute activity in there as well really nice contribution from the glutes depending on the length of stride that you're using um i think i've i think i've covered all of them right yeah yeah so so those are some other options to keep in mind but you know the, the general idea is what you know when people make these hypotheticals uh yeah, there there are these kind of classic categories of exercises to select from but it's always important to make sure you, you consider like, what are the categories that are most critical to me for my purposes? Now, for a general question, you get a general answer. But yeah, I think one of my um, one of my takes that I not not really willing to fight over because I don't care enough, but I think some people put overhead pressing in their program out of a sense of obligation when in reality, they just maybe don't even need it when you look at all of the other pushing and pulling that they're doing like for a lot of folks i look at their program and i say the only thing we really need in here to round out your your shoulder contribution here it's just like a couple lateral raises and, and we should be fine um but yeah th that's my two cents sweet um all right so uh or oryx math's second question was uh suppose again we have a trainee who doesn't participate in any sport but just who but who just wanted to be quote generally strong and fit and athletic if you are going to give them a handful of tests to do say every 12 weeks uh to test and track how quote generally strong and fit and athletic they are what would those tests be a made-up example might be something like a one rep max deadlift 12 rep max squat one rep max push press 100 meter dash what you you get the idea uh, doesn't necessarily have to be a definitive complete list, just some tests that come to mind. Call it the Stronger by Science Combine. What oh are, boy. What are what are some of the ones that come to mind for you? Um for literally no reason at all, I'm gonna say the two mile run. Because well, I there's a reason. I was always good at the two mile run. <laughs> but but I, I think one mile is not quite long enough to really tap into to what I'd be looking for as like a, a quick test of of endurance i think a, a one one mile you can kind of just push through it and I, i'd like to see a, a slightly longer distance covered if i'm looking for endurance performance so i'd say a two mile run would be in there i would say um maybe like a th three rep max on like the squat and the bench press maybe throw both of those in there um I think you could throw in uh, just a max reps on like either pull-ups or chin-ups, throw that into the mix. Um, and then I would say vertical jump test. Yeah, there, there's not much in there that I disagree with. Um, for the, for the uh, aerobic endurance one, I, I might potentially even go a little bit longer, like a 5K or like a five-mile run. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, just to make sure that you are like really testing, um, uh, like aerobic fitness and not just like mostly or like a, a large proportion anaerobic. Yeah. So, some people just like sprint the last three minutes, of their mild tests and then puke their guts out. Yeah. <laughs> it's not really what we're getting at. Yeah. So I, I would go something like that and I would go further down as well. So got a test of aerobic fitness, test of anaerobic fitness, like a 400 or 800. Um, yeah, which that's not going to be fun. Uh, no one, no one enjoys that, but Hey, testing your anaerobic fitness sucks. Everyone hates it. It's terrible, but, uh, that's, that's just how it is. Uh, and then even a step further down, maybe like a 40 meter or a hundred meter dash. Um, a lot more running than I thought out of you. Well, so I, I'm, I'm trying to split it into, like I, I'm trying to be pretty systematic about like, hey, we're gonna test uh, maximal speed, like because yeah, yeah. th this said strong and fit and athletic. I yeah. think I think speed is important. Um, so like a in a hundred meter tests your your takeoff to some extent, but also top end speed. Um, 
you know, four, 800 for anaerobic fitness, something longer for aerobic fitness. Cool. Like now you have your, your velocity and just kind of like energy system stuff taken care of. Um, I, I would, I would also probably go with either a vertical jump or standing broad jump. Um, yeah, just something to test, uh, like explosive performance from kind of a standstill. Um, so which, which is slightly distinct from, from maximal velocity. Uh, and w one of the ones that, that Oryx math, uh, suggested here as well is a max distance med ball throw, which I quite like, um, both the chest pass variety and the kind of like overhead toss variety, um, to, to look at like explosive performance for both the upper body and for kind of like hip hinging stuff. Uh, I think both of those are very good. And then uh, you got strength, strength endurance, and uh, flexibility uh, from there. So for strength, whew, yeah, I think I think like a, th a three rep max squat or bench press or maybe bench press or deadlift would get the job done. Um, strength endurance, I mean, you wouldn't want to do this every 12 weeks, but I think... I think it's hard to beat like a 20 rep max squat test. Um, See, I went with the pull-ups because I wouldn't do that to a person. It's so brutal. I mean, I think, I think pull-ups would also be very good for that yeah. as well. That also kind of gets you some, some like strength to weight ratio stuff in there as well. Um, and then, yeah, uh, I just some general flexibility tests. I don't know. There, there, there are plenty of just, batteries to assess flexibility in different planes so just just pick one of those and go with it yeah um yeah i i probably want to wouldn't want to do all of that every 12 weeks but if you if you wanted to put yourself through a battery of tests that would probably take about a week to complete counting the the rest time you would need to build in between testing sessions that you wanted to maybe repeat yearly just as kind of a check-in to see where you're at um that's that, that's probably the the list that i would go with you know, I'm an industrious fellow, and this is giving me an idea. So imagine, for Ooh, example, maybe like a five cone test as well. Agility, change of direction. Yeah, yeah. I have a wacky idea. It's the SBS combine, right? That's the nature of the question. What if we do an annual combine, and then you know, and it's all you know, you submit videos of your testing, and then we do kind of like a fantasy fitness league instead of like fantasy football, fantasy baseball. Uh, and you, based on the combine results, you draft a team and, uh, and then you, uh, you know, we have some competitive fitness challenges throughout the year. Maybe we partner with like DraftKings or some other big gambling site. Uh, we're open to sponsorships from any, any companies that are worth hundreds of millions of dollars. I mean, I, I've really got the gears turning here. I think we could, we could do something with this. I do think it would be fun if there was so I think one of the I think one of the drawbacks of most like competitive fitness pursuits be that weightlifting, powerlifting, uh crossfit even really almost everything but strongman. You don't you don't get the head to head, you know? Um and so I I think I think a pretty cool I mean, it wouldn't be that cool of a sport. Like, it wouldn't be as cool as, like, basketball or football. But if, if you wanted to make competitive fitness more interesting, like, I tuned into, into the CrossFit games uh, maybe, like, four or five years ago. It was um, it, it was Rich Froning's last win, actually. Um, so I guess that was a while ago now. But anyway, like I, like, I could appreciate how fit all of the competitors were. Like, it was truly impressive. Um, but it was also truly mind numbingly boring television. Yeah. Um, but I think if there was, if there was more of like a head to head aspect with maybe like a bracket element where, you know, maybe it's, it's the type of thing where there's a list of, of 50 events you could compete in and it's like a best of five where, um, you know, the, like one person chooses the first event you compete at, uh, should be tailored to their strengths, the other person's weaknesses. The next person chooses an event. Um, and if it goes two, two, you kick it to the audience and say, Hey, what, what do you want to see for the tiebreaker? Um, so yeah, it would, it would be like all head to head competition. 
there would be the the human element of you know like when you choose the event you're looking the other person in the eye and being like i'm gonna kick your ass here yeah um i i think that if if you were to do a competitive fitness competition that would be a, a more engaging way to set it up all right, well, the ball's in your court, uh, DraftKings. To be FanDuel. clear, I still think that would suck. Like, I, <laughs> I, I wouldn't watch it, but I, I think that it would be pretty entertaining. What, what you're saying is you wouldn't watch it, but it might be more entertaining than like eight percent of what's currently being consumed as entertainment. Yeah, I, I think it would be twenty percent less entertaining than strongman and four hundred percent more entertaining than powerlifting. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> look i i love the sport of powerlifting you're never gonna catch me watching a live stream for a whole day <laughs> yeah zero chance um but but if you if you like the sport the sport and want to support it and uh help it grow yeah watch the live stream yeah so i will say like for for big private events with like big prize pools that are you know, trying to make sure that like the best lifters get paid, like the people who really drive the sport forward, put a lot, put a lot into it. Um, I will often pay for the live stream just to kind of support the event and, and not watch a second of it, but <laughs> I'm like, eh, it seems like a good thing to do. Yeah. Um, all right, moving on the dancing wireless, uh, asks about your transition to a vegan diet, Eric. Um, Eric mentioned on the pod he's now fully vegan. I'm curious if he's made any changes to his diet or training, parentheses, other than obviously not eating any animal products, close parentheses, since making the switch, or if he's noticed any difference in performance or recovery from the gym. Uh, are there any things like supplementation or anything you particularly pay attention to in your diet uh, now that you've made the switch? Yeah, I haven't really noticed anything with performance or recovery. But one thing I've noticed is that like from the moment my eyes close at night until I wake up, erection the whole <laughs> night. Um, that's that's, that's, a, that's I, a throwback I should, for people who listen to like episode 20 of the podcast. I should contextualize that. That is a joke uh, about there was a, a documentary called The Game Changers that uh, was all about like very plant forward diets, uh, in many cases, vegan diets, um, you know, but pretty much anything under the plant based umbrella. But like there's such a, a robust literature one could draw upon to make sound evidence based points in that documentary. But instead, they just had this guy who's like, dude, you're going to have so many erections at night if you're on a vegan diet because your vascular system is off the charts. And so, like, they, they allocated, like, maybe a good 15 minutes of that documentary to just, like, assessing nocturnal erections <laughs> for absolutely no reason. Uh, but anyway, no, uh, that was a joke. Uh, I haven't really noticed anything different, um, which is nice because I felt very good and very healthy prior. And, yeah, nothing's really changed. Uh, performance is similar. Recovery is similar. Uh, food choices are different, but not really that big a deal. Um, there are some restaurants where it's just kind of challenging to find, like very, very easy easy in most places to find a vegetarian option. Uh, considerably more challenging at some places to find a vegan option. Uh, I've been training exactly the same way I normally do. I've been ramping it up a little bit um, just because I've been feeling uh, like I have more more capacity to really lean into my training a little bit harder. Um, so training, I've been ramping that up, but it feels exactly the same. No issues or benefits really when it comes to recovery changes to my diet. I mean, obviously the food sources are very different. Uh, I'm just trying to be a little bit more mindful of, uh, making sure I have some presence of complementary protein sources. One thing I will acknowledge, like the, the the switch has not been challenging, but one thing I will acknowledge is uh, soy protein as kind of an added protein source in a lot of uh, foods marketed toward vegans. I think some people are shying away from soy uh, for a variety of reasons. I think a lot of that is not really driven by science, but more driven by consumer sentiment. Uh, you know, the old uh, 
the the concept of a soy boy and all of the like phytoestrogens i think people are really ramping down their their uh eagerness to add soy as a protein source into some of these foods and a lot of them are using pea protein instead i'm noticing and pea protein is very good um but pea protein in terms of the amino acid profile you would kind of like to even that out a little bit with a complementary source um like uh, I, th- I think soy, if I'm not mistaken, has a slightly more favorable, kind of more comprehensive amino acid profile. So I, I guess uh, the, the biggest thing is that I just try to focus on having a greater diversity of protein sources. So I try to get some pea protein. I try to get some rice protein. I try to get some soy protein. I really try to mix it up a little bit. And I mentioned on the last episode, I just ordered uh, a really big shipment of pea protein, rice protein, and soy protein from BulkSupplements.com. And I'm just going to mix them all together and be like, all right, base is covered. We're good here. Uh, so I'll, I'll let the I'll let the listeners know how that turns out. But really the only difference is that I've been, because I, I, I was always taking uh, algae oil as a source of EPA and DHA, which we colloquially we might call fish oil. Mm-hmm. Uh, but algae oil is a really good vegan source of those fatty acids. I've always taken a, a multivitamin a few times a week. Sometimes I just forget. Uh, so I've continued to do those things, which become relatively more noteworthy when you're on a vegan diet, um, just because uh, you have issues with certain micronutrients getting in the diet and then other issues with just the bioavailability of certain food combinations kind of absorbing all those micronutrients so yeah, I, I i was gonna ask about like b12 iron because you're not getting heme bound iron anymore like calcium stuff like that but. yeah i mean technically like so i take a multivitamin that is specifically formulated for males and they often contain little to no iron yeah uh i'm playing that by ear I feel like with iron, you can kind of let anemia symptoms kind of let you know how you're doing. Yeah. Um, That's not a medical recommendation, by the way. (laughs) But I mean, like I haven't really gone out of my way to get a whole bunch of extra iron in my diet. Um, But but uh, yeah, I still take the multivitamins, still take the the algae oil. The the multivitamins obviously taking care of B12. um, But yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't think that for you the iron would be an issue. Like, I I don't know the statistics right off the top of my head, but my, my understanding is that, like, iron deficiency issues in males are close to non-existent. Right. Like, that, that's that's more of, like, a, a... Not exclusively. Like, there there are certainly anemic men, but it's it's more of, like, a women's health issue for the most part. Um yeah, that that might be something to pay closer attention to once you once you get back into running and you're you're lysing more of your your blood cells. But yeah, like yeah, that all makes sense. Yeah. All right. Uh, moving on here. This is going to be an interesting one. I'm curious to see your take on this. Uh, we've got a question from Isaac. Isaac says, "What are your thoughts on the recent trend of optimizing exercises in order to take advantage of anatomy?" Before I give an answer, Greg, I want to bounce this off you and, and see if I'm interpreting the question correctly. D- does Do you think they're getting at the idea of like working with kind of individualizing uh, your exercise selection and exercise execution based on kind of ind- individual level differences in anatomy, like anatomical structure? Um, is, is that how you read it or do you read it with, in a different way? I read it more in terms of the the content that's like gotten pretty popular on Instagram that's just like, hey, guess what? Uh, 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 preacher curls suck. They actually don't build your biceps at all. Um, but also here's like a, a slight tweak on like a bicep curl variation that's going to be like four times as effective for biceps growth. Like that. that's that's how I read it. Interesting. So, so the idea with with that type of content is that it's supposed to be generalizable across the board, like no matter who you are. I believe. I mean, if if I uh, if I'm interpreting what I presume to be the the connotations of this question, yes. Interesting. I, I'm curious. How would you answer this question? What are you thinking? Um. 
So, because you're the exercise guy, my first thought is that I already answered this. I think I think back in episode seventy. Um, so I th- this question from Isaac, I I already responded to him in the group. Um, but yeah, uh, I don't see the episode number on on the SBS pod, but it, it's the one. It's the episode that came out December sixteenth, twenty twenty one. So about a year ago. Uh, but yeah, my, my general perspective is that, like, I don't think... So, I, I'm i not opposed to the general concept of people being like, hey, based on the, the general line of pull for this muscle and the resistance curve of the exercise and the strength curve of this particular joint action... Um, you know, maybe this exercise is a little bit better than this other, like, variation of a similar exercise. And so, uh, you know, if if you have been struggling with bicep curls, or, like, if you've been struggling with bicep growth, um, you know, maybe maybe give this other exercise a shot instead of preacher curls, if preacher curls aren't working out for you. Like, I, I think that that's um, a, a perfectly reasonable way to approach it, where you... Lay out on the front end. Um, here's why I assume that this variation would be better. Um, there is not solid evidence that it's better, but you know there there are kind of some proxy things that would lead one to assume that it might be. Um, and you know, it's worth giving a shot if whatever you're doing isn't producing the results you want. Like I, I think that's perfectly reasonable. I think a lot of the time it's presented more in the way of uh, what you're doing currently sucks. The exercises people have been doing to build muscle forever, guess what? They they all don't work. Um, But if you do these little tweaks that, uh, yeah, like some some proxy measure might suggest it might be a little bit better. Uh, Yeah, maybe we slap like a, a EMG sensor on like, two people's biceps at the gym and like the the like peak emg readout was like a little bit higher and so yeah we're gonna say that absolutely means that this is way more effective you're gonna grow way more do we have longitudinal evidence absolutely not why would you ask um and yeah so pretty rude to ask that honestly yeah so like it's it's often presented in a way that is very unjustifiably confident um potentially uh potentially sets people up for a bit of a nocebo effect because the thing is like a a lot of the like exercise tweaks that they're suggesting um kind of presuppose that you're training at like a very well equipped commercial gym with uh a lot of machines and like various cable setups and various handles and all of that stuff at your disposal um so like th- there have been people wandering into the stronger by science Facebook group saying like hey like I I see this post about how like this lat exercise is going to be way more effective than just you know doing pull ups or or regular pull downs but like I don't have this machine in my home gym or like my relatively poorly equipped small commercial gym and so like oh no I'm fucked I'm never going to be able to build my lats what should I do um and so I I think when it's presented like that in a very like very unjustifiably overconfident way um in fitness no to 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 an extent that is not just possible but likely to induce um potentially a nocebo effect or at least like a feeling of anxiety in people who are trying to maximize hypertrophy but don't just train in the perfect bodybuilding gym um i'm not i'm not crazy about that uh, and also, just like from from a research perspective, like there's not research on on a lot of this shit. <laughs> um, like I think uh, I think the first longitudinal study comparing whether uh, incline bench did actually build your upper pecs better than flat bench was published like 18 months ago. Like yeah. that that's the state of the literature. So you know, if if we're talking about two like if if we're if we're talking about comparing like uh preacher curls to some variation of bicep curls that 12 humans in existence have ever done like no there there's nothing solid you could actually point to to say yes this is this is absolutely better so yeah in in 
in principle, I'm not a, I'm not against the concept, um, but I think the way that those ideas are often presented uh, might do more harm than good. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, I think your answer is way better than anything I could have cooked up. But like, you know, my, my general approach to, you know, when I, if I'm working with clients and I'm going to assume here that our focus is physique related or, you know, it's trained to like <coughs> generally be strong. It's, you know, we don't have like a, you know, specific exercise that we are training for because it's what we compete in. I try to take a pretty flexible approach there. So like I'll start with, uh, you know, you use anatomy to kind of guide, in my opinion, generally speaking, what types of movements ought to be within this program, right? So maybe we want to be doing a press at this kind of angle, pulling at this kind of angle, you know, some vertical pulling, some horizontal pulling, some incline pressing, some flat press. You know, you kind of work through in these general categories, right? And ultimately, I mean, anatomy has to be a consistent, like, we don't go in, we didn't start with a blank page and say, what kind of exercises could be done, right? Yeah. Like anatomy is informing the way we train muscle groups because of what they do and how they're, how the body is built. Yeah. If you're trying to build your biceps, there should probably be some elbow flexion. Exactly. Whatever yeah. exercise you're doing. Yeah. So, so yeah, at first I was a little thrown off by the question because I was like, well, how do you exercise in the absence of considering anatomy? You know, but we've kind of unpacked the question a little bit, but I like to start out with kind of broader categories and I like to individualize from there working with clients um, because, you know, not everybody's built exactly the same way. Not everyone has the same exercise preferences. And one thing that I think is a little bit unfortunate, you kind of touched on this a little bit, is that a lot of people are like, man, I'd love to individualize my exercise selection based on my anatomy. Uh but I don't have very expensive EMG equipment. I don't have very expensive NEARS equipment. How could I possibly know which exercise uh, variation is best for me without just doing like a 16-week controlled trial on myself and looking at my own growth? And uh, I don't think it's that hard. I think they're overthinking it a little bit. You know, like, I mean, you, you talk to someone who's been on the gym floor training people for a while and... I'm not sure if a commercial grade EMG sensor is going to tell me much more than if I have you do an exercise and I say, okay, at the end of that set, what felt kind of fatigued, you know, uh, you know, two days after we did that, what felt kind of sore and, and the same thing with like nears, I feel like you can do a set and be like, Hey, do you have a pump and where <laughs> like that's, that's largely going to tell you what a lot of these commercial devices are telling you. So I think, uh, like you said, some some of that content does have the uh, adverse impact of potentially a little bit of a nocebo effect. And I think an, another thing is like some of the content makes it seem so inaccessible to troubleshoot your own technique and kind of individualize your own technique uh, in terms of exercise selection and then the actual execution of an exercise. You seem like you had uh, your, your brow was furrowed. Uh, I, I thought about saying something that I deeply and sincerely believe about this topic, <laughs> but that would also, I fear be perceived as lobbing a bomb and I don't want to deal with, uh, the potential drama it would cause. So I'm, I'm going to be a good boy and not say what I was thinking. You know, th that's your right. You don't, you never have to say something that you don't want to say. All right. That, that's the way the show works. But yeah, so. I, I kind of see it as like, I don't know if there's a way to not optimize your exercise technique and, and execution uh, in a way that doesn't take advantage of anatomy. I think that's kind of the default way to do it is, is you start out with really broad strokes. Okay, what muscle are we targeting? What movements actually do that? All right. So then you have your broad category of movements. And then you individualize and troubleshoot from there and say, okay, well, when, when we're doing these exercises, which ones are pain-free, you know, or, or disc, you know, very comfortable to do minimal discomfort when we're executing them. So which ones are very comfortable to perform? Which ones do we enjoy performing? Which ones seem to really be targeting the musculature we're going for? And we can base that on, you know, subjective fatigue during the set soreness a couple days later where we're getting a pump during an extra you know and none of those things in isolation are perfect proxies i should acknowledge that but overall it's you go through a workout you can kind of tell what you hit right yeah. and even people who are pretty new to lifting with a little bit of guidance 
you can get that information out of them and help them kind of pick up on, okay, what seems to be working here? What doesn't? You go with what works and you move on from there. Yeah. And and another thing I'll add is just like there are... There, there are pretty big inter-individual differences in, in a lot of this stuff. Um, I, I wrote about a study in mass, eh, maybe like two, eh, like, a, like a year or two ago, um, that was looking at the, uh, the, the relative activation of the hamstrings following, I think, like two or three different hamstrings exercises uh, in like a, a group of like 20, 30 subjects, something like that, where they had um, like like individual activation like, or individual EMG data for each head of the hamstrings for two different exercises um, and, and could essentially compare, you know, which exercise caused more uh, activation of like the long head of the biceps femoris. And there was like group averages, but then there were, there was also like a lot of, inter-individual differences like like one of the exercises was better overall but for like four out of the 20 individuals the worse exercise seemed to elicit greater activation of the long head of their biceps femoris same general principle applied with the semi-tendinosis and my membranosis so like yeah like i i ultimately think that the sort of if you're if someone is out there proposing that like this one version of this particular exercise to target this particular muscle is the optimized version that is just like flatly better than the kind of normal version in a generalizable sense and that that will be the case for essentially everyone um i i am extremely doubtful of that um like i i I do think that it's essentially what you're proposing like your body is is giving you feedback like if you have uh, especially if you've been training for a while and you have what one might colloquially refer to as a mind muscle connection for whatever muscle you're training. Like, I mean, you can, you can feel like, ah, is this exercise giving me a pretty good contraction for this muscle I'm targeting? Is it not? Uh, and does this ex is this exercise giving me a gnarly pump or is it not? Like that's, that that's, that's individualized feedback, you know? And it's, it's like relatively low resolution feedback, but I don't know that it's that much lower resolution than <laughs> slapping like a single EMG sensor on a muscle uh, and hoping for the best. So, yeah. And another thing is pe- people will be like, well, you know, people that don't train very often, they're not going to be able to really utilize that, that uh, biofeedback that relies on this really good mind muscle connection and this kind of internal focus of attention. But like, mm, just like go do some hard shit that you don't do very often. Yeah. Like, do you have a pre-established excellent mind muscle connection for like digging a hole with a shovel? Probably not. But the next day, two days later, you can kind of tell where you're sore and be like, wow, I feel wrecked. Yeah. Like y- you don't have, you don't need to build up like three years worth of experience with an exercise to say, okay, now I can tell what's hard. I mean, I do physical things quite frequently that are are out of the norm and it's it's not hard to tell in the aftermath what was working yeah for sure all right a uh, quick question here from uh oh should we go on to this one from jason this is one from jason about uh this is kind of related because it's talking about uh you know hypertrophy and benching at a particular angle so we can we can kind of stay on theme here so Jason's got a question. When flat benching, is there an advantage for hypertrophy if you use a low incline? I guess this is saying in uh, in comparison to flat benching, but using a low like 8 to 15% incline uh, to counteract retracting and arching. Um, so basically, uh, the hypothesis that they're they're asking about here is the idea that flat benching with an arch or retraction is safer for the shoulder, but puts the delt and upper pec at a disadvantage. So more pec is being used. Should you use a low incline to counteract that? Does that question make sense to you? Uh, a lot of words. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, one don't, don't necessarily object to the premise, but question the premise. Um, 
that arching and retracting is really like that much safer for the shoulder. I don't know. Maybe it is. Uh, there, there's th th that's not something with a ton of research on it, or potentially any research. Um, it, at least nothing solid that I've seen. Um, so yeah, like it, the the simplest answer could just be like, oh, well, you know, if if hypertrophy is what you're concerned about, um, maybe just like bench more like the typical bodybuilder bench setup than the typical powerlifter bench setup, and that that might do. Uh, a, a lot of the work for you um but yeah then would would a low incline counteract that and like i don't know potentially maybe um subjectively i really like low incline bench uh, i i've talked about this on the podcast before um low incline is my favorite barbell pressing variation don't really like flat bench don't really like a standard like 45 degree incline really like low incline um but that's like that's a purely subjective thing like it it just feels good to me um i could see it being slightly better than flat in a somewhat generalizable sense not maybe for some of the considerations in this question or i think more likely just because it allows for a slightly longer range of motion like with uh with flat bench especially if you have a bit of an arch and you're touching around like your lower sternum or uh like upper stomach area i mean that that's limiting range of motion like range of motion seems pretty important for hypertrophy with a low incline you're you're not touching low on your sternum like it it forces you to touch like nipple line or slightly above so like that's that's just necessarily going to lead to a slightly longer range of motion both for uh both for your pecs and your triceps like more elbow flexion more uh more horizontal abduction. So yeah, like I, I think that it is, it is probably better. Um, that, that is my suspicion, but I, I would chalk it up more to just range of motion than, than anything else. Yeah. And I do want to clarify, Jason, as I was reading your question, I stumbled over it. It was very challenging for me to read and speak at the same time. I don't want it to seem like I'm disparaging the question because I do think it's a very good question. Uh, but you know, reading, is not an easy thing to do, especially in front of a microphone. Um, so yeah, I, I also really like the low incline. I guess I can kind of get on board with the, the spirit of the question because like if I do a ton of flat bench pressing and really hammer it over and over and over, sometimes my right shoulder, ah, you know, it does start to, you know, get a little bit angry with me. Um, and, and part of that is because Greg, as you know, I'm like a pretty flat bench or flat, flat back bencher. Uh, so for me, flat benching, because I'm not doing a lot of arching, you know, it, it can kind of chew up my shoulder a little bit. And I do have a pre-existing uh, shoulder injury. That's kind of a funny story in and of itself. But uh, I, I do lean a lot on the low incline bench because I am able to, you know, I'm very hypertrophy focused. I'm targeting the musculature I'm trying to target. And it does seem to make my shoulder a little bit happier when I'm doing low incline versus flat. Um, but but I do everything in between. I do the other day, for example, I went into the gym. Um, I've been doing, uh, uh, what are they called? A false grip bench press mm -hmm. with my thumb kind of cradling the bar. I've been doing a lot of that, but just getting into it. So I was going to bench that day, but my actually <laughs> my the chubby little part of my palm where my thumb goes was actually still very sore. I'm mm -hmm. getting used to having the bar resting there. So I was like, you know what? I'm, I'm just going to do some dumbbell pressing instead. And uh, so, so I worked my way from a super high incline that was basically like a like a seated shoulder press, mm -hmm. you know, really high incline. And I just gradually worked my way down to the lowest incline bench uh, that was doable with the bench I had. It's simple, it, but man, it it's that's a lovely way to go through a nice push workout is to start out going from very high incline all the way to very low incline, moving on, doing some other shoulder and tricep accessories. But man, uh, it's simple. I remember doing it when I was like 16 years old. It was one of, you know, my, I had a coach I would work with. He's like, dude, we're going to just blast our pecs today. And we would do that. But like, it gets the job done. You know, I, I do love a really wide range of incline pressing. Um, keeps my shoulder happy. And uh, yeah, great stimulus for the pecs, deltoids, etc. Um, the story I had, the story about my shoulder injury, I, I always get a little bit of, 
a little bit of irritation where my biceps tendon runs through the shoulder on the mm-hmm. right side. I was at a football camp uh, went back when I was playing. Uh, and the first day of camp, I was playing defensive back. I knock down a pass, swat it, and land on kind of the point of my shoulder there. You know, the, the classic kind of tuck and roll over the shoulder. And when I landed, uh, I was not wearing shoulder pads. I was like, man, that that didn't feel great. Yeah. Uh, and it, But it was a camp where you like traveled out, you stay in the dorms. So it was like three and a half practices a day, basically, all day football. And uh, man, the next day, I'd gone through the first like, two practices and was like dude my shoulder is not feeling good go to the uh athletic trainer and they're like oh yeah i see what's going on no big deal you're having muscle spasms in your pec uh so i encourage you to ignore it and i was like all right fair enough like at that point in my life i took instructions very well and uh i had sufficiently convinced myself damn pec spasms hurt a lot but here we are. Let's go through it. So I, I finished the rest of the camp, like three practices a day for the next few days. My mother, I, I couldn't even drive at this point. I was so young. My mother comes to pick me up from the camp. and <laughs> I wasn't wearing a shirt. It was like middle of the summer. My right nipple is like an inch and a half below my left. And <laughs> she's just walking up to, to pick me up. I was like, from like 30 feet away, it's like, Jesus Christ, what <laughs> what happened to you? And I was like, oh, mom. This is what happens when you have uh, a strained pec and it's spasming. And she's like, no, it's not. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so we went to the doctor, a separated shoulder and a broken collarbone. (laughs) And I was playing football on it for like three days and uh, that didn't help. So anyway, my shoulder has never really been the same after that for very good reason. Uh, So yeah, I have to I have to baby it in the gym a little bit, but ultimately it's not that hard to work around. As the first and only fitness podcast with a steadfast commitment to traditional family values, we know that protecting families is important. Right you are, Eric. But I will note there are some things that are even more important than protecting traditional family values and the moral fabric of our society. That's right, Greg. It's important to protect families, but it's even more important to protect corporate entities. That's why I joined the advisory board for the Sports Nutrition Association, along with trusted fitness pros like Danny Lennon and distrusted arch nemeses like Eric Helms. The Sports Nutrition Association is the home of sports nutrition. They are dedicated to ensuring the sustainable prosperity of the sports nutrition profession, and they offer a unique pathway to robust insurance coverage for your sports nutrition business. Simply put, it's the best way to protect the corporate entities that are closest to your heart. And I should note, if you're an individual sole proprietor uh, providing sports nutrition services and not a corporate entity, the Sports Nutrition Association can help you out as well. That is correct. All insurance plans are handled individually on a case-by-case basis, regardless of how your sports nutrition business is structured. But even if you don't want insurance coverage, SNA membership comes with a bunch of other perks and advantages. The Sports Nutrition Association is the only global professional sports body that has a defined standard for sports nutrition scope of practice for its members. This ensures that members maintain high standards in their practice so that the public can always trust in the quality associated with the services of an accredited sports nutritionist through the Sports Nutrition Association. If you already meet their minimum education requirements, you can become an accredited sports nutritionist today. Uh, If you don't meet those education requirements yet, you can enroll in the certificate program in Applied Sports Nutrition. That allows you to become a provisionally accredited member upon completion. To learn more about the Sports Nutrition Association, head over to www.sportsnutritionassociation.com today. Today's episode is sponsored by the Sports Nutrition Association and Stronger by Science LLC sincerely appreciates their support. All right. Uh, let's see. True Chains uh, asks, weird ultra specific question that might be interesting to ponder. I built a deadlift platform some years ago in my garage, and it turns out the section of the floor it's on has an approximate 5% incline. When I deadlift, I have to ensure that the loaded barbell doesn't roll off the platform between sets. It's a bit annoying, but I haven't given it much thought beyond that. 
I've been deadlifting like this for a couple years now. Recently, while doing maintenance calories, I ran a deadlift peaking program. Uh, my training on this program, the first few weeks was fine, not great. Partway through, I went to visit my parents and used their local gym. And my deadlift numbers improved tremendously in training sessions. Blissfully, the floor I was deadlifting on was completely flat. My deadlift training sessions felt mediocre again when I returned to my janky platform. Is deadlifting on an incline actually affecting my deadlift numbers, or is it just in my head? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll take the first swipe at this. It could be any number of things. So, um, one, it might potentially be a weight calibration issue. Um, you know, if, if you have, like, reasonably old equipment, um, it might be slightly heavy. Or, alternately, uh, the weights you used at the gym that you trained at may have been slightly light. Um most most new plates are actually calibrated really well, but uh, especially like a lot of like like weight equipment that you might get from like a garage sale or a Craigslist sale or something like that that's 20, 30 years old, or if it's just like a like an old commercial gym uh, near near your parents' house, if they have old equipment, um, there used to be like actually pretty serious weight calibration issues. Uh, a, a YMCA that I used to train at. Uh, their 45 pound plates weighed anywhere from like 37 to 42 pounds. Like they, they were all underweight. Some of them say 37, 37, wow. like significantly underweight, um, which like th that's, that's extreme to the be 45s clear. weighed 37. Yeah. So, so then you make that big Instagram post after a meet with calibrated plates where you're like, man, I just didn't have it today. <laughs> yeah like, dog you never had it <laughs> yeah it, like the, that was i mean that was a i think very underfunded ymca it had yeah. it had some janky ass equipment it was some brand that i had never seen before and have never seen since yeah um but yeah so th so that is one potential uh explanation another potential explanation is uh you noted that you you train in your garage and temperature can have an impact, can have like a pretty notable impact on performance. Um, so particularly if it's cold, um, if it's cold, man, I, I have such issues like working out in a garage and just getting my body ready to deadlift and, and perform well. Um, and, and that, that's like, that's a, that's a pretty generalizable thing. So if, you know, if you live somewhere where it's reasonably cold and you have this experience in like the fall, winter, early spring, um, it's chilly in your garage, room temp in the gym, like that can absolutely contribute. Or conversely, like if it was during the summer and it was really hot, uh, short term uh, resistance training in the heat does actually improve force and power output a little bit, assuming it's not ridiculously hot. So I'm talking like 85, 90 degrees. If it's like 105 degrees, like, ah, no, like that's, you're, you're not going to perform at your best there. Um, but if it's like a kind of high volume program, like you'll, you'll definitely fatigue faster in, in pretty noteworthy heat than you would, which, which might reduce the perception of like the overall quality of the session, even if like the first set or two, uh, goes pretty well. Um, but yeah, then beyond that, uh, just addressing the incline itself. So I, I wanted to start by by ruling out some other potential confounders that that may matter more than the incline. But as far as the incline goes, I think it would depend in large part on uh, how you oriented the bar relative to like the slope of the platform. So if you're uphill of the bar, like the bar is trying to roll away from you, then in effect, it's like you're deadlifting with a slight heel lift and also with a slight decline because the bar's like lower than the center of pressure of your foot. Um, so if that's how you generally set up, you could test this for yourself. Uh, the next time you go to a gym with a flat deadlift platform, um, elevate your heel slightly and deadlift with like a half inch or a one inch deficit. And see if that feels similar to training in your gym. If it does, then yeah, that's probably what's going on. Uh, and the opposite could also be true. So if the bar is uphill of you and it's like trying to roll into you, um, yeah, th that would essentially be like deadlifting with your toes slightly elevated from like a a like a very low block pull. 
And it might be hard to find like the low blocks, but you, you could certainly try that out for yourself. Just the next time you deadlift with a flat platform. Uh, yeah, just, just elevate the balls of your feet on maybe like five pound plates or even two and a half pound plates and see if that affects how it feels. Speaking for myself, I do think that both of those things would affect my deadlift. Um, and that could just be that I, I've always pulled in either flat soles or barefoot on flat ground. But yeah, when, so I, when I used to dabble with weightlifting a while back and also just when I used to do a lot more front squats and just like didn't want to change shoes between squats and deadlifts, um, like my, my deadlifts just felt worse when I was pulling with a raised heel. Um, and I've also done a fair bit of, um, like RDLs with my toes elevated, uh, for, for whatever reason, I just feel a deeper stretch in my hamstrings when I do that. I'm not entirely sure why. Um, some people I've seen claim that that is not in fact a muscle stretch, but you're actually just like, uh, like, like putting the nerves at a slightly longer length and you're feeling a nerve stretch. Um, or, I, I think it's also plausible that like there are like fascial connections kind of all the way down your posterior chain. And so if you're putting your calves in a little bit of, of a stretch, like your hamstrings will also feel that stretch a little bit. Um, regardless, I, I like toe elevated RDLs, but uh, yeah, my, my performance is certainly worse with my toes elevated. I'm just doing that with like pretty low to moderate loads for reps uh, but yeah, if, if I had to pull a one rep max with my toes slightly elevated, I think that would hinder my performance quite a bit. Um, but yeah, like you, you can test that for yourself as well. So I, uh, yeah, I, I think there, that there are certainly con potential confounders in this situation. Um, but I, I do also think it's, it's very plausible that the slight incline itself, uh, could be playing a role. And, uh, yeah, uh, next time you pull on a flat platform, uh, you you can try some of those things to test it for yourself. Well, I can tell you, I've deadlifted in some crappy situations where the bars were rolling all over the place. Uh, when a bar is rolling away from me, it drives me nuts with a deadlift. Uh, part, it could be totally subjective. I hate it. Um, honestly, though, deadlifting with an elevated heel, I would say I certainly don't mind it, and I might actually prefer it. I think I have relatively poor ankle mobility mm -hmm. such that having a slight heel elevation, like a half inch heel, um, I, my, I, I had the old, uh, Adidas shoes with a half inch heel instead of the three quarter, the Adidas power lift. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Which I really like those shoes, but the half inch heel, I actually really like deadlifting with those. Um, again, I'm kind of on the fence if I find it to be the same or slightly better, but if I had a client, who, who reported this kind of thing and it was just driving them nuts. Or if I was in this situation, I think one thing I would do is I would make it such that I was deadlifting in the direction where it was a decline. So the ball is or the ball, the bar is rolling toward me and my, my toes are kind of higher than my heels. And I would just wear an, a, a slight elevated heel shoe, like uh you know, like a, like a half inch heel or if, if you got it. And I would just see how that feels because mm -hmm. I, I actually think that'd feel pretty lovely for me. So, uh, you know, there's some ways you could try to work with this and, and check out the situation, you know, try some things facing this direction or that direction, elevating the heel to, to try to account for things. But yeah, I mean, that, that would be my first thing that I would try personally. And, and I have access to those shoes. So easy for me to say, but, um, but yeah, if, if you can find some reasonably priced, uh, uh, Olympic weightlifting shoes with a little bit of a heel elevation, it might, might not be the, it might, it might be a pretty comfortable solution. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's see. Question from Dan to wrap us up. I All believe. right, cool. Uh, so Dan says, I know you've addressed this before, but I wonder if your answers have changed since you last answered it, particularly given Eric's recent enlightenment status. Uh, once again, congratulations for Thank completing you. the road to enlightenment record time. Uh, how do you guys manage work life balance between all the research for mass stronger by science, coaching slash company stuff, macro factor, the podcast, speaking engagements, etc. If I was in your guys shoes, I could imagine being a bit overwhelmed by it all. So first off, uh, thanks for the question, Dan, that last, 
uh, paragraph was almost entirely flattery, which will get you everywhere in life, and we certainly appreciate it. Uh, so do you want to lead off, Eric? Yes, uh, I'm going to keep this pretty concise. This is the type of question where it can be tempting to kind of go on and on and on. I would uh, kind of view this as two separate topics. Uh, when, whenever I think about work-life balance, I think first there's the um, the element of just kind of coping with the workload and the stress associated with, with stuff uh, professionally, and then actually taking proactive steps to facilitate work-life balance. Um, so when it comes to coping with a high workload or a high stress working situation, I try to focus on three things. And I just started reading a book. I haven't finished it yet. And I'm sure I will answer this question more effectively after I'm done with the book. But I'm reading a book by Thich Nhat Hanh called How to Focus. And it's kind of comical that I haven't finished the book yet because it is very tiny. So I, I, I want to get out ahead of the judgment that I'm going to face for that. It's like the si- the dimensions are like the size of a postcard and it's not many pages. So, you know, whatever. It is what it is. But um, yeah, it, it's called How to Focus. And, and it, it kind of talks about uh, obviously focusing, but really getting yourself to move and, and do some, some work, uh, at least some of the passages I, I've gotten to so far. And there, there's a few things that, that jump out to me when I read through that book and when I think through situations um, you know, in, in my own career, things that have helped me cope with a high workload or a stressful environment. Uh, number one, trying to be really passionate. So trying to cultivate a high level of passion for what you're doing. Now, you could be cultivating a a high level of passion and enthusiasm about the task itself, or perhaps the task itself is boring as hell, and you have to try to cultivate a lot of enthusiasm about the reason behind the task. You know, there are some things we do for a business that are not fun, but they are critical for the broader pick, you know, the bigger picture, the broader goal. So trying to cultivate a lot of passion and enthusiasm for what I'm doing Rather than saying, how do I alleviate stress or how do I trim workload? I try to focus more on how do I amplify my level of passion and enthusiasm. Uh, Another thing that I try to cultivate is curiosity. Uh, And that comes in when you do all of the research related work that we do. You know, sometimes you can get in a a situation where you're saying, "I, I feel like I'm just like trying to hit this quota of content, right? Where you're like, I just have to push through and create things for the sake of having created things. I notice whenever I get to that mindset, this is where I really start to feel, you know, the the workload and the stress. And I try to take it a step back and simply embrace a level of curiosity about the work that I'm doing. What can I learn from this? You know, how can this work uh, really be insightful and illuminating? And how might I truly learn new things from what I'm doing? So curiosity is huge. And then um, the third thing is instead of, you know, sometimes when we're, we're really burdened by a huge workload or a really high stress work situation, we focus a lot on the effort or the time or the stakes of what we're doing. And I try to shift my perspective and focus more on the impact. So I don't think about what if I don't finish this on time? What if I do it too poorly? What if people criticize it? Uh, I shift my focus and say, if this goes well and is done effectively, what is the upside? You know, in what ways will this be beneficial and impactful for the people that it's being made for? So trying to focus on passion, curiosity, and impact. Those are the three things that I really prioritize. Now, when it comes to facilitating work-life balance and trying to be proactive about that, uh, number one, I think it's a good idea to look for genuine waste in your day and your habits and trim it. And what is waste? That becomes really subjective. It's kind of difficult to say, Um, you know, because I I also have read another book by Thich Nhat Hanh called How to Relax. And relaxing, resting for its own sake can be a really helpful thing. It can be very, very restorative. But I've tried to think about what is my high quality rest and what is my low quality rest? So like if I'm truly sitting in silence and enjoying a cup of coffee, that can be really restorative rest. If I think I'm having downtime and I'm just like playing the TV in the background and listening to the chatter, but really I'm just thinking about the work I have to do tomorrow, 
that is shit. That that is low quality rest. That is not restorative. It's not really doing what I want rest to do for me. So I'm not saying that you should never rest. I'm saying that your rest should be really, really high quality rest, right? It, it should really mean something and make an impact. So if you if you can find areas where there is just genuine waste in your day where you're like, that's supposed to be restorative and I'm not getting anything back from it, cut it. Uh, any major inefficiencies in your schedule, try to cut them to the extent that you can. Uh, and, and like I said, leisure time is not something that is to be necessarily minimized or resting time, but you need to make the most of it. Um, like I, I used to be very obsessed with efficiency and I'm glad to say that that's, uh, not really where my head's at anymore. Like I, obviously efficiency is important, but I used to be hyper focused on efficiency. And there was a great quote in, in one of Tick's books where someone was like, you know, Tick Nhat Hanh, Zen master, monk, uh, poet, scholar, did a lot of things, uh, peace activist, the whole deal. Um, but he really likes gardening. And someone was talking to him and they said, Tick, you got to stop with the gardening shit. Anyone can grow lettuce. You need to be doing your scholarly work and you need to be writing your poems because you're a good scholar. You're a good poet. Anyone can grow this freaking lettuce. So cut it out. And he said, I can't write poems if I don't grow lettuce. Mm -hmm. it, it is baked into who I am. You need to have rest. You need to have hobbies. You need to have leisure time that is restorative so you can bring your full self and be your best when you're doing the stuff that actually employs you. Yeah. Um, number two, I think you need to plan uh, family events and social events pretty ambitiously. Uh, sometimes I fall short of this, um, but I'm also very introverted. So my appetite for, for a lot of, uh, you know, social interaction is a bit lower than most. Um, but a lot of times I, I have found that when I really get down to it and I say, no, I don't have time for that. I don't have time for that. If I just schedule it and do it. The other stuff will get done. You know, you, you, it's, it's kind of like how sometimes when you are sleep restricted, you'll notice that there are actually objective increases in sleep efficiency to try to like kind of make up for that. Mm -hmm. What I find is if I go ahead and schedule the family time or the social time, my work efficiency can increase to the point where I still get the same amount done without quality being impacted. I just get it done in a slightly tighter time window. There, there's less wasted time during that work effort. Uh, and then another thing, the final thing I'll say with work-life balance is that um, sometimes you just got to say no to things. And this is something I struggle with, but whenever I'm struggling, I come back to the fact that even if you don't verbally say no to things, you're still saying no to things. Because when someone brings an opportunity to your inbox and you say yes to it, even though you might not think about it, you might not verbalize it, you're actually saying no to a lot of different things. Wh whatever you've just committed to and said yes to, you have said no to every other thing that could have filled that that space in terms of time and effort. Yeah. So you think you're saying yes to everything, but you're actually saying no to way more things than you're saying yes to. You're just not thinking of it that way. So, uh, being really thoughtful about where am I going to allocate my time and effort and when the time is right, sometimes you just got to, you just got to say no. Uh, what do you got for this one? Yeah. So I, um, I used to answer this question by just saying like, eh, I don't really have much work life balance. I'm a workaholic. That's just how I'm wired. I've done a bit of introspection and I don't actually think that's true. Um, cause I mean, that was, that was never historically true for me. I was a very lazy student. As I mentioned on the podcast many times before, I was a dog shit employee at every job I ever worked. Um, yeah, I'm, I, I don't think I, I am just like congenitally wired to be a, to be a workaholic. Um, but so I, I was thinking about this a little bit more. And I actually think that it makes a lot of sense in the context of self-determination theory. So, uh, like, the three core tenets of self-determination theory are autonomy, competence, and relatedness. Um, and, and looking at my job and what I do now, uh, autonomy, there's plenty. Um, all of the companies I'm involved with, uh, I'm a co-owner, I don't have a boss, 
Um, you know, I work on teams. I can't, I'm not just completely a free agent doing anything I want, but I, I do have pretty broad autonomy, um, to, to do most of the things I want to do and spend most of my time the way I want to spend it. Uh, competence is the second, uh, kind of core tenet of self-determination theory. And most of what I do is intellectually engaging and interesting, like a, a, pretty big part of my job is trying to learn new things well enough that I can communicate them to other people, which is, um, you know, that that's, that's a competence pursuit. And then, uh, a, a good chunk of the rest of what I do is like interacting with people who consume the content, uh, which I mean, like there's, there's a competence element of that as well. Like, like, Fig like not just learning the stuff, but kind of iterating and trying to figure out how to convey ideas as well as possible. And I I've been thinking a lot more about the communication uh, aspect recently as, as some of the rants I've gone on in the last couple of podcasts uh, might suggest. Like I, I do think that it's a legitimately challenging, but also interesting problem to figure out how to communicate things with depth and nuance in a way that is still, um, that, that like will still have reach, you know, like I, I think that that's an interesting project to work on. Um, so yeah, like there, there, there are certainly just kind of like more mindless aspects of, of my job and, and what I do day to day, but, uh, relatively speaking, like not a ton, like, like most of it, um, is, is kind of related to a competence pursuit. Like they're, they're, it's not it's not just things I can turn my brain off and do on autopilot. Uh some some of them I can, but it is more fun and engaging and just better if I approach it more as like, hey, here's here is an opportunity to practice this skill. Like try you know, try this new uh like like try a different idea for how I might communicate this and, and see if it seems to resonate better. Uh and then, you know, once again, just trying to learn new things, which uh I, I think is is inherently interesting to people. Um, and then the, the last element of self-determination theory is relatedness, um, which largely relates to like doing things socially. Um, you know, be, being around and spending time with people you like and value. And, uh, yeah, I mean, like, like I said, um, all of the work I do is in teams and I like all of the people and all of the teams I work on. Like I like you, I like Lindsay. Um, I like Mike. Uh, this contradicts the lore of the podcast, but I, I do actually like Eric Helms. Good to the guy. To the extent that it's useful. Correct. Yeah. Um, like Corey, like Rebecca, uh, the devs from Macro Factor. Like, um, I like Adam, who does uh, support for Stronger by Science and Macro Factor. Uh, I like all of our coaches. Like, I don't know. Like, I, <laughs> I, I am a very social person, and... Um, yeah, I, I like all of the people I work with, which, uh, which is great. And I mean, even, even when there's not like a team thing going on, like you come over to work Monday, Wednesday, Friday, but, uh, and, and we meet with Corey and Rebecca every so often, but you know, e even when, uh, it's not like a, a team meeting, I mean, I'm still, I'm still working in, in the room next door with Lindsay who, uh, yeah. Yeah is my wife. I love her very much. Also my best friend. Also, uh, I, I work with her in all of the things I do. So, uh, yeah, there's, there's like a big relatedness component there as well. And so, yeah, like I, um, I, I mean, not to mention, I mean, interacting with all of the like readers and listeners, like that, that's another element too. Yeah. I, and I like at least 40% of them. Like yeah. they're, no, I'm, I'm joking. It's probably closer to like 85 if i'm being completely <laughs> honest there are some stinkers if you're listening not talking about you yeah um but yeah so it, it uh, most of the work i do satisfies uh most of the components of self-determination theory and so like from the outside looking in it still probably looks like i have pretty dog shit work-life balance but also most of the things related to my work uh kind of meet those core psychological needs um and so like i like them i don't know uh like th there there are certainly 
plenty of things that I would rather do than work. So, you know, uh, uh, time with family, time with friends that is completely divorced from any work obligation, uh, like you mentioned. And so I, you know, certainly make time for that. I, I value and cherish that stuff. That's very important. But when it comes to work-life balance, like, you know, could I end work two hours earlier and take up some other hobby? Like, I don't know, maybe, but also, uh, like Lindsay and I have fairly different interests. Um, it, it would like, I could certainly go and like make more friends to, to do like another social hobby with people, but also like, I don't know, like I, I like my family, like the friends I have, um, you know, I, I don't feel like I have a huge dearth of friends and that I like need to go out and make more. So like that might be fun, but I, I don't feel a, a need to do it, I guess. And so like, yeah, I, I think for the most part, uh, the work I do satisfies a lot of those just like core psychological needs that people have. Um, and so I would just prefer to do it relative to a lot of the other alternatives of, of ways that I could be spending my time. So yeah, uh, I, I work a lot, but I, I genuinely enjoy what I do. Um, and if the details of my job were very different, uh, I might pursue more robust, uh, work-life balance as it's traditionally defined. Yeah. Yeah. I, I definitely echo that. I mean, like, uh, m most of our work, really lends itself to intrinsic motivation. Um, but even on the times where you're like, I'm struggling to approach this task with passion, enthusiasm, curiosity, I'm struggling to see the broader impact of it. There is still that element where much like yourself, I just really like the people that I work with. And uh, so that makes it even easier to say, for the team, let's pull it together and do a really good job on this, mm -hmm. you know? Um, but, but I could definitely see, like you said, if, if the work situation were a little bit different and we didn't have a high level of autonomy and relatedness, if we didn't really feel like our work was benefiting an employer that really <laughs> appreciated us or <laughs> viewed us as a human being, like, yeah, it, it could be quite different, but yeah, like I, I do, I, I would not willingly put in the same quality of work and the same number of hours for a fucking greedy capitalist swine who is expropriating like 60% of my surplus labor value. Correct. Yeah. yeah. So, so I, I do feel um, on the one hand, a little hypocritical talking about, oh, here's how you create work-life balance. Because much like yourself, I do work considerably more than the typical average like 40 hour work week. Uh, but at the same time, I, I view it as a psychologically completely different thing uh, w within the context of what we do. Um, so I'm, I'm happy as a clam, liking it. At, but but it was interesting because um, th there was a time where uh, I, I had family staying locally for an extended period of time. And I had to explain like, so you're going to think I'm a degenerate based on just the hours I keep <laughs> like you're you're gonna text me sometimes at 9 a.m and get a text back at 11 p.m where I say hey what's going on like it yeah it's sometimes I just get really consumed in it um but but it's usually because of passion not stress and panic and, and all that kind of stuff but yeah I was like I had to kind of like say like I know it's going to seem like my life sucks, but it's actually really great <laughs> like I really like what we're doing and that's why I do it a lot um but yeah, so hopefully some of those tips were uh, generalizable outside of the context of what we do, or can at least help people uh, maybe consider like ways to make their work situation more uh, more conducive to their own happiness and fulfillment. You know, hopefully. yeah. And, and ju just as one uh, w one, I guess, final parting thought on this, um, like I I will readily acknowledge that we are both incredibly fortunate with our with our work situation um and one of the things that we've that we have been like kind of snarky about on on the podcast before and i think with good reason is just kind of like the the idea of hustle culture um and especially like as that relates to social media content like all like all, yeah, all of like the sigma about the memes yeah, yeah like the the sigma grind set memes yeah um 
But what I will say is like, I, I think that there's, I, I think a lot of that stuff is, um, I don't know, j- just kind of like valorizing work and putting in long hours for its own sake. Um, and is also just kind of like, oh yeah, like, like do, do this because it's, uh, going to make you a lot of money and, uh, money's good. And, and there's certainly no reason to think about that further. Uh, you know, it's, it's absolutely good. And really the only thing you should be pursuing and that's that. And let's not think about it anymore. Cause this is, this is supposed to be a meme that, uh, you know, uh, gets you to hustle and grind or whatever. But what I will say is that I do think that there is like an element of that that does kind of make sense. Like if you have a work situation where like, you know, those, those, uh, needs of like competence, autonomy, relatedness, like aren't being met at your job. Um, you know, you have a manager who's like micromanaging everything you do. You're doing just kind of like mindless, repetitive work where, you know, there's not much space at all to pursue increased competence. Like you're, you're essentially just a human machine, you know, um, or you're working in kind of like an isolated cubicle. There's, there's no real, um, sort of like team feeling, um, with, with like your coworkers and like a sense of camaraderie there. Like I, I do like absolutely understand why people want to, uh, like develop a side hustle to get out of that as quickly as they can. Um, and so, yeah, if, if that's, if that's something you're interested in, I, uh, support you 100%, but, um, I still think most of the people making content in that space are charlatans, but very funny. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I respect the effort towards side hustles for sure. Uh, but some of the memes are just comically terrible. They're they're so good. <laughs> yeah. They're so good, man. All right. Um, I think that does it for this episode of the Stronger by Science podcast. As always, uh, we really appreciate for you for listening. But one thing I almost forgot to mention, you're, you're getting this episode on the 28th of November, which means it is the final day of the mass Black Friday sale. Lowest prices of the year proceeds uh, a part of the proceeds do support charity that fights hunger during the holidays so it's a great cause it's a great product if you're interested go to strongerbyscience.com slash mass to check it out and learn more like i said the black friday sale ends today november 28th uh once again thanks so much for joining us and we'll be back soon with another episode thank you for listening to the stronger by science podcast If you enjoyed the podcast, be sure to sign up for our free newsletter to get concise breakdowns of relevant research, as well as 28 free training programs for all skill levels and all schedules. We hate spam just as much as you do, so we'll only email you when we have something really interesting to share with you. You can sign up for the free newsletter at strongerbyscience.com slash newsletter, or just go to the Stronger by Science homepage and click the free programs button at the top. If you want to join in on the Stronger by Science podcast conversation, be sure to check out our Facebook group and our subreddit. The links for both are provided in the description of today's episode. Finally, please remember that we are not medical doctors or registered dietitians. So before you make any changes to your exercise or nutrition habits, be sure to check with a qualified healthcare professional. Once again, thank you for listening, and we will be back soon with another episode of the Stronger by Science podcast.